Our next speaker is Sandra Rana. Dr. Sandra Rana has been active in interfaith and community-based organizations in Tulsa for more than 30 years, a past president of Tulsa Metropolitan Ministry and on the boards of Tulsa Interfaith Alliance, Say No to Hate, the Canipa Lecture Series, the City of Tulsa Human Rights Commission, Jobs for Veterans Committee, and the City of Tulsa Police Relations Committee. Uh, she is a tireless worker on behalf of us. Please welcome Dr. Sandra Rana. I want to first thank you all for coming today. Um, it's, I, I've come to these for many, many years, and it always is impressive, uh, the turnout of the crowd. Notwithstanding the Super Bowl, it's also really cold outside. So right. I appreciate you all coming um, and, and attending, and I would also encourage you to come uh, to the rest of the events. It's so critical and important. And in part, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first, let me uh, begin in the name of God, Bismillah, Man Um Just to add a little remembrance to most of the people who probably already know this, the city of Tulsa has a very rich history uh, in, in its handling of interfaith and diversity. Um, it, may, it may begin and end at the city limits, but it does have that very rich history. And I'm, I'm so thankful uh, that when I graduated from, from college, uh, by luck and happenstance, I ended up in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, Tulsa Metropolitan Ministry and OCCJ have a very long and rich history, dating back even to the Tulsa race rights of protecting people of different colors and faiths, uh, providing sanctuary, standing up for the rights of others. Uh, during the time period of the 30s and 40s uh, with, uh, and 50s with the integration and civil rights movement, those organizations took a stand that was neither popular um, nor supported by uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the legal system that we had at that time, and they did it out of the sense of their faith. And, and that's kind of the direction that I want to take with this. And that is the importance of that interfaith connection in the kind of, of atmosphere and society that we have here in Tulsa. It's not perfect, but in hearing stories from other communities and other locations, I can tell you that we do become an example of what the possibility and potential happens to be. I know it will be covered in another trilogue, so I'll just touch upon it. As it has already been mentioned in, in our local mosque here, we represent uh, somewhere between 20, uh, 39 and 40 different nationalities. And I might point out at least three Native American tribes. Let's not forget the natives. I'm one of them, that's why, okay? Um, I think that it's, it's important to know that, uh, and again, it will be discussed more in the next uh, Trilogue series, that in, in our faith tradition, the importance of community, UMA, it's, it's all important, and race is not considered a factor. We talk about um, that relationship in the time of the prophet, peace be upon him. One of his companions was Bilal, who was, a, who was an African, and how uh, the prophet, um, often asked and requested him to do the azan because it was so sweet hearing it from his voice. Um, and so, so the concept of, of race within our congregation is much different than it may be in, in other congregations. I know I was, I was quite alarmed, uh, both because my background's in human resources and employment law, as well as religiously to see about two weeks ago the Tulsa World talk about um, the National Baptist Convention, which had broached the discussion of whether or not to integrate their congregations. And I thought, my gosh, it's 2015, and we're still talking about whether or not we can integrate our congregations. If you've ever seen us in prayer, we pray shoulder to shoulder, men in one section, women in another section. You don't look to see to the left or the right, in fact, you're not supposed to when you pray, to see if the person standing next to you matches your ideal of what an ethnic group or race should be. Um, so this is a concept that's a little bit um, unusual for us uh, in a religious sense. 
Uh, and so that, that kind of shades our approach toward this to begin with. Uh, in the early history uh, here in Tulsa, uh, Brother Farrakhan, Imam Farrakhan from the African American community was, was very prominent. Um, they originally joined uh, with Tulsa Metropolitan Ministry and later uh, we were invited to join as the Islamic Society of Tulsa and our, our brothers and sisters um, in the early 70s and 80s had a, had a great vision that we were not, um, and I say we as a religious sense, um, we were not strangers to this land, that we were a part of this community. Um, the big joke, I know many of you know Cheryl Siddiqui, is that her family came on the Mayflower and my family greeted them on the rock. So we, we, have, we have nowhere else to go. This is our country. But, but for the other brothers and sisters who came here, they came here by choice. They wanted to be here. I knew many families who said we came here for an education. Then they decided to stay a little longer because they were getting married. Then they stayed a little bit longer because they were having kids. And I'm, I, you know, it, it, it stirs me to know that even today, I heard of a third generation Tulsan who was born here. Parents came here, the kids came, were born here, and now the grandkids are being born here. So we're here, guys. I, I, I you know, hate to tell you that. Because of that vision, because of that vision, we recognized that we had to be a part of the larger community. Just as the rabbi mentioned, as a minority, you can't stay in one little place because you're going to be all alone. And the impact of what happens in the larger community, and that's how we usually refer to it, or at least some of us do, in the larger community impacts us all. Homelessness, um, um, uh, loss of job, uh, disease, this doesn't pick a religion or an ethnic group or a racial group. It picks people. We're all people. And so our commitment has been from the beginning in Tulsa that we would be a positive force, that we would integrate ourselves into the larger community. Now I will be honest, there was some debate about um, about doing that. Would we lose some of our religious identity by doing that? And what we found was that quite the opposite was true. How many of you in school has been, have, have had the opportunity where a teacher told you you needed to help tutor another student? And at the end of the day, because you put that effort into the tutoring, you ended up knowing more than you did to begin with. Most of my strongest uh, 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 religious um, uh, education has not just come from the mosque, but it's when somebody calls me up and says, hey, they need you to go speak on this topic. And I go, oh my gosh, <laughs> okay? And, and where you start talking to other brothers and sisters who are so wonderful and caring and patient to explain it to you, to give you the depth of knowledge, it makes you actually a better person. It doesn't dilute you. And so that was something that our community recognized. One of the things that happened, and we have to go by historical events, is the fact that because of that integration, we had people on school boards, we had people heads of Girl Scout troops and Boy Scout troops, we had people who had been active in various uh, city commissions, who had participated in, in various events uh, of, of the community, either fundraising for, for different projects or donating time or services, so that when the first major action that occurred that impacted us, which was, was the Persian Gulf War, you know, we had problems. We had people who, who attacked us. We had, we, our mosque was attacked, but people knew who we were. We had a, a meeting in the mosque, I'll never forget it. The second mosque that we had here was in Birmingham, was on Birmingham, which is in the Kendall Whittier area. And, and the decision was made, are we going to hide? Which some people said, let's do that. Let's just hide, go to your, go to your home, lock the door, forget it. And there was another group who said, no, we're a part of this community, we need to stand up. And because we had previously integrated ourselves into the community. People knew who we were, we knew who they were. And that made a world of difference. 
because we didn't fear them and they didn't fear us. Because guess what? We were all Tulsans. We were all facing that same problem and dilemma. Um, that was a lesson that unfortunately, to counter that in Oklahoma City at that time, they didn't have. There was a concern about where are they? How can we be sure they're safe? Nobody was answering a phone. Nobody knew how to get in touch with them. They had taken the opposite approach at that point in time from what we had done. And it made a huge difference. I will tell you that interfaith work is extremely delicate. It's a balancing act of diplomacy. It takes unique people to do it. There are some people, and I know this from talking to others in different congregations, who do a wonderful job inside their congregation. But they are really bad at interfaith. It's their way or the highway, okay? And, and one of the things that we learned, and I know other congregations and other faith traditions have learned, you need people who are diplomatic. You know, I'm not the scholar. There are people behind me who are the scholars who provide me the basis, the foundation, the knowledge. But they don't feel comfortable in an interfaith setting. Okay? Um, so, so one of the things we, we developed by luck and chance and the blessing of God was a cadre of people who understood the importance of that diplomacy. Understanding there's not anything taken away and only more to be gained by those connections. That has stood us in good stead. When, when they came to renovate, to take over and do urban renewal at Kendall Whittier, they, we got totally discounted. There was a note posted on the door. Urban renewal said, there's only 100 of you there, and you're gone. In fact, we were more like two or 3,000 just in a normal Friday prayer. Um, and, and so by being discounted, we recognized that we needed to connect with the elected officials in the same way we had done with the interfaith community. And I want to thank them again publicly for standing by us. They came to the, to the, to the committee hearings, they came to the, to the public hearings and said, these people have a right to worship here because these people have been active in Tulsa. They have contributed to Tulsa. They're not going home, this is home. That is the blessing of interfaith, whether it's interfaith from religions or racial groups or ethnic groups. That is the blessing that we have in Tulsa. By the same token, we have an obligation too. And we, we try to fulfill that obligation. Kendall Whittier needed a new school, desperately. And the people who live there needed to be treated fairly and to have a good transition to new homes. And we went to those same public hearings to, to demand that Kendall Whittier get a good school and that those people who live in that community got good homes. It's not a one-way street. You have to be willing to give and share as well as to receive. The other thing that's important in this process is listening. You have to hear the other person. Sometimes you may not agree. That's the beauty of diversity. You may have different opinions and different, and different visions, but you have to listen to each other and at least understand why they have the vision that they have. And that's what, what hopefully this community has been able to do through things like TMM and TIA and OCCJ and all of those or other organizations. There has been a real commitment by this masjid to do that. One of the things that we have a difficult problem with that the rabbi has also explained that they have is getting the youth involved, getting them committed. Our problem to some extent is, is we train them and then they leave. And we hear wonderful reports about what they're doing some other place across the country. And we don't mind being the, the institution for that. But we're hoping and praying that some of them stay here <laughs> and continue that growth. But, but I want to emphasize to you that it is 
a balancing act. There are people in our congregation who are fearful. They, they are afraid to go outside of their homes because of what they hear on the news, because of how other people treat them. It takes a certain amount of courage to stand up and say, yes, I'm Muslim, yes, it's okay, I live here, I'm not leaving, and no, I'm not a part of anything else. And, and that's not easy to do. But I think that, that the, what's important when we talk about racial differences or misunderstandings is the importance to listen, to share. And in the tradition of the old Southern custom that, that my mother and father grew up in, to break bread together. You may salt it differently, but you'd all eat it. Thank you. Thank you.